two major religions of the world Christianity and Islam Christians claim from the Bible that Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross Christ through the spirit he talks about himself I was dead now I am alive but the Muslims assert from the Quran that he was not killed nor was he crucified the messenger of Allah وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا سَلَبُوهُ They did not kill him, neither did they crucify him. And what is the truth? Decide for yourself. Pastor Roknuddin Henry Pio better known as Pastor Rukni is 43 years. He is an Arab Christian missionary. He was born a Christian in Basra, Iraq and later on brought up in Kuwait. He has postgraduated Masters in Science from the University of Bombay. He has had varied experience in teaching including computer education and training, teaching the Arabic language, consultancy for computerization and development of computer software programs in Arabic. He has been in the field of conveying the message of Christianity for over a decade. He is a Bible teacher and preacher with the India Gospel Mission. He is also a renowned faith healer. the second speaker for the day, Dr. Zakir. Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik, 33 years, is the president of the Islamic Research Foundation, Bombay. A medical doctor by professional training, he has turned around to make the proper clarification as well as removing misconceptions about Islam, his main mission in life. He is a keen student of Islam and comparative religion. In the last three years itself, Dr. Zakir has delivered more than 300 public talks abroad in addition to his many talks in India. He has also participated in many symposia and debates with prominent personalities of other faith. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to God, Lord of the worlds. A respected Pastor Saji Palikal on my right. Pastor Roknuddin Henry Pio on my extreme right, Dr. Zakir Naik on my left, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the organizers, the India Gospel Mission and the Islamic Research Foundation, I welcome all of you to this unique event today, a discussion, a dialogue, a symposium, a debate, whatever you may prefer to call it, on the topic, was Christ really crucified? It is being held in a spirit of friendship towards understanding each other's viewpoints. I. Dr. Muhammad Naik, I am the coordinator for today's program. Hence, I will be neutral. It is my onerous duty to ensure a fair and proper conduct of today's meeting. Therefore, I would request our speakers as well as the audience collected here today to maintain Geo decorum for a healthy debate. Before we got here today, I was asked 
by many people. Why this topic? Why these speakers only? The answer to which I could briefly summarize in the background to this debate. Pastor Rockney had come to the Islamic Research Foundation for a discussion with Dr. Zakir. It was mutually agreed between them that instead of a personal discussion between them, it would be more preferable and better to have an open public debate on a particular topic at a convenient hall, such that the public too could hear and share in the debate and be the final judge. Dr. Zakir suggested the topics, is the Bible God's word or was Jesus God? But Pastor Rockney considered these topics too common and instead suggested the topic selected for today's debate, that is, was Christ really crucified? That's how the topic for the debate and the two speakers are before all of us today. As agreed to and decided fair by the speakers, the format for the debate will be, Pastor Rockney will address you first for 45 minutes on the topic, was Christ really crucified? Then Dr. Zakir will make his presentation on the same topic for 45 minutes. Then we would have a rebuttal session in which Pastor Rockney would comment and respond for 15 minutes to what Dr. Zakir has spoken, followed by Dr. Zakir too speaking and responding for 15 minutes to what Pastor Rockney has presented. When five minutes are left to conclude the talk as well as the rebuttal, I as the coordinator would hand each speaker a five minutes left slip, an indication slip like this, in which time both the speakers are kindly requested to conclude their talk or rebuttal. Lastly, we would have the open question and answer session in which the audience may pose questions to each of the speakers alternately on the question mics we have provided, two here next to the stage and two in the ladies section. Only if time permits, we would allow questions on slips which may be passed on to me and I would read out to the speakers. I would like to now briefly introduce the speaker, Pastor Rockney, before his talk and I would likewise introduce Dr. Zakir before his talk. Pastor Ruknuddin Henry Pio, better known as Pastor Rukni, is 43 years. He is an Arab Christian missionary. He was born a Christian in Basra, Iraq and later on brought up in Kuwait. He has postgraduated with a Master's in Science from the University of Bombay. He has had varied experience in teaching, including computer education and training, teaching the Arabic language, consultancy for computerization and development of computer software, programs in Arabic. He has been in the field of conveying the message of Christianity for over a decade. He is a Bible teacher and preacher with the India Gospel Mission. He is also a renowned faith healer. May I call upon Pastor Rukni to make his presentation. Pastor Rukni. Uh, just a small comment. Uh, even though my name is Rukni, uh, it is a variation of Rukni Deen. But very rarely people call me Rukni Deen and uh, even in my official document I'm Rukni, so you call me Rukni early. Uh, the, uh, there are many things we can discuss and many things we can talk about, but practicality doesn't permit, so we settled on one topic. 
because uh, you know other uh, goes on and on and then understanding will be lost hmm? so we settled on one topic uh, you asked me why uh, I suggested this topic I suggested three things and uh, then this was selected from it uh, reason is because this is a very central topic in the Christian faith and there is a very serious difference between the uh, Muslims and the Christians um, in this point. So as uh, Mr. Naik has, Dr. Naik has suggested, we're going to very frankly, but in a spirit of friendship and understanding. So here is just we are uh, presenting our views from our side and left for you to uh, choose what you like and uh, reject what you like. We respect each other's views and even when you say no to my views, I respect your feelings and I totally honor your saying no. So I'm just presenting the point. Now, uh, a few things I'll be picking up from the Bible, but if I go on picking from the Bible, then there's no end to it. Because there are maybe hundreds of verses related to the cross. Uh, so some things I will just say it's from the Bible but without really telling you where is it maybe a few things I will read from the Bible uh, because my purpose is here not that you re memorize which part and all that just my purpose is that you understand the message behind it the spirit behind the uh, message of the cross uh, why is the cross central in the Christian faith what is the reason the cross is so important. First of all, let me comment on the cross itself, physically the cross. Uh, what you understand, many people understand, I'm not saying all, many people understand, the cross is the following. I go to Zaveri Bazaar, search for a not very expensive jeweler, and have a nice shining little bit gold cross and hang it around my neck, and that is very suitable to fashion. Uh, some will buy a gold 17, some 18, some gold or 21 good nice attractive looking cross going with fashion matching my dress colors and all etc that is what many people understand of the cross even many Christians that is the end of the understanding of the cross and that was my understanding many years ago I am born and brought up in a traditional Christian faith I am a believer Christian only 16 years ago I came to India not a believer I came to India as a plain traditional Christian uh, but I became a believer here through Indians through Indians you know so um, I, I received the faith in Christ here and now why the cross is so central now the Bible does not refer the cross as something attractive something uh, pleasant to decoration it, it, in fact, there is a picture completely opposite in the Bible. The portion of the Bible in the old part of the Bible, that is the books of the Jews, uh, the first half of the Bible, we call it the Old Testament in the uh, English language, it refers to the cross as something not nice. You'll be surprised. Uh, it refers to the cross as something ugly. It says, the cross is a place of cursing. The cross is a place where somebody who is to be punished badly, and somebody who is cursed, somebody who is rejected by society, the cross fits him. And there is a statement in the uh, books of the Jews, the first half of the Bible, that says, it's God's word uh, said by a prophet. It says, Cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. Uh, it was a reference to the uh, tree, a reference to a cross. Um, so, uh, when in the life of Jesus, the cross was not a pleasant thing, desirable, but it was a necessity for something which I'll explain. Um, uh, the Bible, as you are aware of, uh, some of you may not be aware, just quickly, is made out of two sections. It is 66 collection of 66 books uh, written over a period of approximately 4,000 years. It's not one book, it's a collection of books. 
And uh, uh, the first half, that is the books of the Jews, uh, uh, it is uh, mainly prophetic and written by prophets of various history in the life of the uh, history of the Jews. And right from the first book onwards, there is uh, sometime almost directly, but very often indirectly, reference to the cross. Now, the, why there is a, uh, wh where does the cross come? Why, why the cross? I have not yet explained it. I'll try to come to the point. Uh, basically, it's the gospel. It's the gospel, the, the, the news of salvation from sin. There the cross comes. Uh, essentially, uh, the Bible reveals to us that man is a sinner. Man is a sinner by nature. He inherited that from the days of Adam. I was born and brought up, and in my nature, I'm a sinner. And therefore, I, I sin. Sin by thoughts, sin by words, sin by behavior, and many, many, many things. It's the nature of man is sinner. And the Bible also says that the person who sins, he reaps death, a sentence of death. Uh, there is a spiritual death, there is a natural death, etc. So, there is a sentence of death on every human being on this earth because of sin. Because sin is offensive to God and therefore man and God cannot fellowship together, cannot come together because of that enemy sin between them. And now what happened is, this sin is so grievous and so serious and so great that whatever I do to pay for the cost of the sin to get rid of it, it is too small, not good enough to wipe sin from my life. See, if I give charity to the poor, it is very nice, that's a beautiful thing, the Bible recommends to do that, but it is not big enough to wipe sin from my life. As far as it's a good act, it is a good act, but not good enough to wipe sin from my life. Okay? Now, God sent Jesus, a perfect man, a man without sin, a man would refer, prefer to suffer rather than sin, an exception, a person who sin did not enter him. He was tempted in every way, but yet he did not sin. Therefore, the sentence of death does not belong to him as it belongs to all of us. He deserved to live forever. That was the quality of Jesus from the spiritual point of view. From the point of view as man, he walked as man on earth like anybody else. He had to work for his bread and many different things like anybody else. But from the spiritual point of view, he was not worthy of death because sin did not succeed going into him. Okay? So in that sense, he was a perfect man. Now this Jesus obeyed God to the point of being wrongly sentenced to the death of a sinner. Okay? So therefore, satisfying the justice of God that death is the price for sin. A perfect man who don't deserve to be dead, who don't deserve to taste for death, and he was willing to die on behalf of others, paying the price of sin. Therefore, the cost he's paying is worthy to wipe away sins. It, see, the, 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 the sacrifices which everybody does in trying to remove sin from their life is not successful in removing sin. But Jesus, because of his value of being sinless, because of his value of obeying, obeying God till the end, therefore the sacrifice he offered was acceptable to God as a cost for sin. And there, that is why the cross of Jesus is central in the Christian life. And that is why it is necessary for Jesus to die the death that God knew about it beforehand. And that's why he was, um, uh, his death was the key 
for those who believe in him and those who receive that sacrifice in their heart and accept it they are entitled that their sin is paid for you know it is a, a, a cost for paying for the sin you know that is what the cross is in the Christian life that's why it is central that's why you remove the cross from the Christian life you have removed the whole Christian faith uh, many people, not just Muslims, some other people also, uh, they, they, uh, they say Jesus did not die on the cross. That was, uh, that was uh, I'm, and I'm not, uh, of course, doctors like you will know better than me in details, but my part I say Jesus did die on the cross. And I'm going to, uh, in the time available, as, now I just give you a, an idea why the cross is important, central in our life because that death was the key for my sins to be removed from my life it's a free gift from God God paid his the price himself God himself paid the price therefore what he pays is good and worthy enough to remove sin not like a sacrifice I would do it is a polluted sacrifice because a sinner offering a sinner offering a sacrifice a polluted sacrifice but Jesus a perfect man offering himself though as if he was a sinner he was willing to receive the punishment of a sinner but he was not a sinner it is a sentence of spiritual death in me he said you don't die it give it to me and I'll take it for you and now I'm going to just go uh, through some of the historic things uh, in the uh, scripture uh, some of them are indirectly talking about the death and the sacrifice of Jesus some of them directly, very clearly speaking, some of them indirectly. So I'll go through some of few few things here and there as time permits me. Now, uh, you know the first five, five books of the Bible are written by the prophet Moses. And uh, the first book is Genesis. Uh, that uh, describes the history of God created the earth and the first development of human beings in the old times in Babylon, etc. Now one thing is, you're, I'm sure some of you, and most of you in school have learned, at least heard about the story of Adam and Eve, how Adam and Eve was created, and he had fellowship with God. There was no barrier between Adam and Eve and God. Therefore God and Adam and Eve see each other. They talk to each other. There is fellowship, there is oneness between Adam, Eve, and God the Creator. Why? Because there was no sin between them. Okay, that's, at that time before sinning. Now, later, when uh, the devil who came in the uh, this deceiving form of a servant and he succeeded, causing them to sin, never mind what he sinned and all that, basically it's written in the scripture, some fruit they were forbidden to eat and then they ate it. Uh, that fruit is not important. What is important is, is that they did obey, disobey God. They did disobey God and something God warned them that they are not allowed to do. So when they did that, then sin came to earth. And then Adam and Eve was separated from God. From that day onwards, the rift between God and man started. Many people say, I wish I could see God. I wish if God made the heaven, why I can't see him? Why I do so? Many people wrongly give wrong, uh, bad attributes on God because they see evil around them actually evil is man has made it not God but what happened God is righteous in his judgment and see some of the things that happened in the past very small incident I'm not reading the whole thing just small part uh, when Adam and Eve sinned against God and then uh, uh, God was so angry with, with the serpent, so angry with Eve, so angry with Adam, each one accordingly received some measure of a curse in his life. Hmm? Now the serpent received a curse that the serpent will be, uh, all the days of her life will um, crawl on the dust. And uh, in the case of Eve, uh, God told her, because you have tempted your husband to eat that which is forbidden, from now on, your husband rules over you, and uh, you'll be in submission to him, you'll be dependent on him, and also greatly her uh, birth giving, uh, pregnancy, uh, there's a great pain increase on her. In the case of Adam, his main problem was that uh, from now on, when he works in the ground, the ground doesn't give him fruit easily. He'll have to sweat and work very hard till food comes. 
and, uh, and then uh, their life was limited because death entered their life. From that point onwards, they are not meant to live forever. They are meant to. But one thing is very important, is uh, related, is, uh, is about the cross, so the indirect uh, reference to the cross, uh, which I will just read a, a point here. Hmm? It says, uh, see, God, after declaring the various curses on Adam and Eve, huh, uh, in, uh, if you'd like to write the reference, you're free, uh, just, I'll read it, uh, just okay. It's in the beginning of the book uh, of Genesis chapter 3, says, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden, Eden that is in reference to Adam, and of course and his family, of Eden uh, to till the ground from which he was taken and he drove the man and he placed uh, cherubim and so he drove the, out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of uh, the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way uh, to guard the way to the tree of life see uh, if those who wish to refer it is Genesis chapter 3 verse 23 24 uh, See, uh, simply is, after God declared the various things on them, uh, and uh, sentence of death basically on them, uh, God chased them out of the garden of Eden. Eden. That beautiful garden, uh, which we normally refer to it as heaven, uh, but actually uh, uh, some beautiful place where they used to enjoy the place, God drove them out from that garden. And what did he place at the entry point of the garden? He placed an angelic being. It's called uh, angels have different type of categories. One of them is called the cherubim, the closest to God. So angelic being standing at the gate of the garden and he's got a flaming sword and the sword is going right, left in all directions to make sure nobody enters that garden again. See? What is, what is the way to the Garden of Eden? The, the, the way to the Garden of Eden is only if you pass through that sword. There is a sword at the Garden of Eden which is watching over the entry to the Garden of Eden. And as a Christian and as I relate it to other things of the scripture, there is death price to enter the Garden of Eden. That sword has to fall on somebody. Uh, because God is righteous and his justice demands that that sword had to fall on somebody. You see, Ad Adam could not come inside. There's a sword guarding the Garden of Eden. That sword is the death sentence on the one who dares into the garden. And uh, we see later Jesus uh, willingly gave his life according to the will of the Father, and that sword fell on him. And therefore, the garden, the day, the, today the door to Garden of Eden, the door to Garden of Eden is open. Not only to Christians, to all those who believe. See, I, uh, uh, Jesus said, I am the door. He said, I am the door. You want to know the Father, you want to know the heaven, you want to know the good things of God, I am the door. Jesus allowed that sword to fall on him. So that is indirect reference to the cross. Now I'll go a little further now. The uh, Bible is rich of indirect references to the cross. And also there is a lot of direct reference to the cross. We're just talking about cross, nothing else. Okay. Now, uh, another example is the famous story of the father of all the faithful, Abraham. Now, I'd like to commend something. Very few know that the Christians and the Muslims are brothers. Very few know that. Really brothers, not just, make you, not just to make you feel happy. You know, really brothers. The Christians are the spiritual descendants of Abraham through Isaac. The Muslims are the spiritual descendants of Abraham through Isaac, uh, through, I'm sorry, Ishmael. Ishmael. Ishmael is the brother of, of Isaac. Really, Muslims, Christians, they come down from 
Abraham. They are brothers, but they are not natural brothers, they are step brothers. They are brothers from different mothers. So when I say brother to a Muslim, it's not just to make him feel nice. It's really a brother. His spiritual earlier father is Abraham, Prophet Abraham. And my spiritual earlier father is Prophet Abraham, same Abraham. Okay? Okay, so that's just diversion, never mind. <laughs> Little diversions I do here and there. I'm not a very serious teacher. Uh, some interesting things in between I put. Uh, okay, now we'll talk, look about Abraham. Uh, Abraham had the famous story of being tested concerning his son, Isaac. Now, I know some of you are not familiar with the Bible, so I, I add a few basics. Because I know not all of you have read the Bible, some of you may have not read. So I will just not put too much details, but just to get your feel of it. Now Abraham, God told him to come out of Ur because it's a land of sin. Ur is in Iraq, it's near Basra. Uh, I've been there, now it's deserted, there's nobody lives there, just some monuments there. So uh, uh, because it's a land of sin, God told him, get out of, it. Get out of Ur. Come, I'll take you to a land uh, much better than this, a place better than this. Now Abraham did not know what sort of a land God took, but he obeyed God and he moved. And God did not keep his promise immediately. It took a long time. And for many years he was married to Sarah and he, she was barren, she couldn't bear children. And for many years he, God told him, I, I, I'll give you children so many. Look at the stars. So many stars are there in the sky, that much he was your children. Look at the sand in the sea, so much sand is there, that much children. But for many years he never had children. But by faith he believed God. By faith he moved, you know. By faith he moved. And um, after many, many, many years, after many years, then his wife got fed up, you know. And in those days, not today, in those days, it was not immoral for a person to marry several wives, and even their servant women can be a wife also. In those days, it was morally perfectly all right. Okay? Now, at that time, his wife told him, uh, why you don't marry uh, our servant, so you can have at least children from her. So he did, uh, had a servant from Egypt, her name is Hagar, so he married her and he had Ishmael. But then it was time for Abraham to have a son according to the promise, according to God's word. And his own wife, Sarah, became pregnant and she bore a son, Isaac. Imagine what is the heart of Abraham after so many years having the promised son. You know, imagine you are married and, and, and for say 20, 25 years, no children, God promised you a son, God promised you, suppose you are a very wealthy man, who's going to take all this money? They will cheat me and they'll not take. Then afterwards, after 20, 25 years, and your wife expect a baby and a child is born. Imagine how is you feeling towards that boy? After so many years of waiting for that boy, that what happened to Abraham. That was his heart attachment to Isaac, his son. And then one very nice night, something very interesting happened. Something very interesting happened. Yes, could you help me with the reference? With Isaac, testing with Isaac. 22, chapter. Genesis. Genesis. Uh, Isaac, no. Uh, it is in Genesis. Nice, my pastor nearby. He'll help me to pick it up. <laughs> I told you I'm not a very great teacher, but the spirit of the message I'll give, okay? Uh, even though I, uh, okay. Now, in Genesis chapter, uh, uh, that is about Isaac, huh? uh, chapter 22, uh, it says, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Okay, it is sounding very simple, but it was a very serious thing. And said to him, Abraham, and said, Here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and after him there, uh, offer, and there offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Very terrible thing happened to him. After so many years waiting, and the boy become a little teenage, you know, quite strong, he could carry luggage with his dad, as mentioned there. So, God says, I want him as a sacrifice. Okay? Now, uh, I'll come to the point which I'm saying. I'm not putting all things together, okay? Just a few points. Then Abraham 
with all the pain in his heart, faithfully gets up early in the morning and take all the tools necessary to offer the sacrifice, the knife, the fire, etc. And he goes all the way to where God told him to go. Okay? And then he left the servant behind and took his son and went to the Mount of Moriah where God has told him. And then something very interesting takes place. Very, very profound statement takes place here. There. I'll, sh I'll take shortcut. So, uh, um, uh, But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? <laughs> the son said, We got fire around. Uh, we got uh, uh, wood. Uh, and me and you alone going up the mountain. Where is that? Uh, usually they offer a goat or a lamb. Where is that lamb? Huh? And now see what happens here. And, and Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And the two of them went together. It's a very profound statement. Abraham spoke by faith. He said, God will provide for himself an offering. See? He didn't say God will provide a sacrifice. He said, God will provide for himself an offering. Now, if you read the books of the Christians in the New Testament, that is the second half of the Bible, the authors, they expand on this point. And they said, Abraham spoke by faith. When he spoke to Isaac, when he spoke to Isaac, he was thinking that God will raise him back from the dead when he spoke to Isaac. That's how he spoke. Uh, something like this happened, but not exactly arose him from the dead. And then they went up, and then they came to the place where God, which God has told them. And Abraham built the altar there, and placed the wood in order, and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Notice that his son didn't run away. He allowed his father to tie him up, although he was a big boy at that time. He could run away. Okay? And then what happened? And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called that name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. See, uh, summary of that thing is, summary of that very dra big drama is this is Abraham went up and then he thought God will provide for himself a lamb. God is demanding a sacrifice. See, I'm putting my own words in between. I'm just paraphrasing. God demanding a sacrifice. There is a, a, a need for a sacrifice. God wants a sacrifice. But where is the, where is the lamb the sacrifice? God will provide for himself the lamb. That's what happened. And that's what happened. God spared Isaac. God spared Isaac. God was not even thinking of killing Isaac, the Bible says. He was just testing Abraham. God not in the business of killing children like that. God, he gave him Isaac as a gift. He wouldn't just take it like that from him. Okay? And, and then God, through miraculous act, he stopped him at the last minute through an angel of God in a very critical point in his time, life. And he said, he gave him one, some other thing to be sacrificed. Not Isaac. So here we Christians, we look at it this way. God spared me. God spared me. I'm in the place of Isaac. Anybody who believes in Jesus in the place of Isaac. God spared me from the sentence of death of sin. There is a sentence of death of me. And God's justice demands that wages of sin is death. You see? And... It is right that I should die and go to hell. Okay? 
But what happened? God provided a sacrifice for himself. Christ Jesus is the sacrifice uh, on the cross. Uh, you look at Jesus, you believe in him, you receive him in your heart. Therefore, God's justice is satisfied. That sacrifice instead of me. Right? Any man dies for me is not good enough. But Christ dies for me is special. There are so many people who die for each other. There are sometimes husband die for his wife because he loves his wife. That's a very noble act. That's a beautiful act. Okay? But uh, I'm talking about saving from sin, not saving from small things. Saving from eternal judgment, from hell, from the fire of hell. Any sacrifice will not do. Will not do. The New Testament, the Christian part of the Bible says, God... He's talking to believers, of course, Christians. And he said, God delivered us not through the blood, or sacrifice of blood of goats and cows and animals and all that. I'm not hurting your feeling, I'm just telling you what it says. Uh, but he delivered us through the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ. See, that is so central, so central in the Old New Testament and post New Testament. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, my sins were paid for. In the eyes of God, there is a list of sins that needs to be punished in me. But Jesus said, put it on me. Put it on me. I, 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 that, that list put on Jesus. You see? And therefore, but if somebody else die for my sin, nothing happens. I, I will not be safe from sin. But only particular person, a perfect person, is having that, um, uh, that privilege and heart to die for others. He wash away their sins. See? Right. Now, there are many, many things written in the Old Testament. Many, many things. I'm not going to read all. I'm just going to just refer it to you. Huh? If you'd like to refer it, I'll help you later. Uh, I would just to know how much time left is. Uh, exactly 13 minutes. Left. Yes. Or, or gone. Like it. Oh, they are better rush. Better rush. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the Old Testament, God gave symbolism of the cross. And uh, uh, you know the story of uh, the Jews being saved uh, from Egypt. Very famous story in the history of the uh, Jewish nation. They were slaves in Egypt for several hundred years. And then God visited them and he saved them through miraculous act. And uh, he gave them this symbol. Tonight I'm going to kill all your enemies, the children of the enemies at that time. And to force them to leave you. And he made them slay a perfect lamb. A lamb without blemish, not sick, not blind, not limping. A perfect lamb. And God told them, you put the blood of the lamb on the doors of your house. And in the night the angel of death will come. Any door that don't have that blood, their firstborn will be dead. But this is what happened to the Jews in that time. They, they obeyed and they put the blood at the gate. And the whole nation, Jews nation, that night were given permission to leave Egypt. That day I was, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, that was a reference to a perfect lamb. A sacrifice of a perfect lamb. Not any lamb. I won't just bring any lamb. For a perfect lamb, there is a salvation from death. That is a symbolism. Really, it was not the lamb. It was a symbol of Christ coming later. Now you go later, uh, one time in the history of the Jews, they rebelled against God. They did it many times, ten major times they did it in the Sinai. And then the serpents came and just bit them one by one. And many were poisoned through serpents. It is mentioned, fiery serpents. And then God told Moses to do something very strange, very strange. He told him to make a serpent made of bronze, brass, and put it on a high stick. And everybody from the Jewish nation looks at that serpent. He'll be healed from the poison of the serpent. Now it is mentioned in the New Testament, comments on that. It says, see this snake is a serpent, is a, is a symbol of the devil. Snake is not the devil. Snake is just the symbol of the devil. Snake is just an animal, okay? And now what happened is, Jesus was hung on the cross, became a serpent for us. He who was perfect, more perfect than angels, but he was willing to be like the serpent sin on the cross. You look at him, you receive him in your heart. Tonight your sins are washed away. Tonight your sin is washed away. 
You don't need some religious ceremony. Tonight your sins are washed away if you receive him. You look at Jesus who was hung on the cross. That is the so central. So central is the cross in the Christian faith. So central. Uh, and through all the history of the Jewish nation, God told them symbolism. He gave them symbolism to remind them of forgiveness of sin. He said, you bring a lamb that is without blemish. There is no spot in him. He's not blind. He's not limping of certain age. Only that I accept as your religious ritual sacrifice. God was reminding them the future Christ. The perfect blameless lamb from the point of view of sin as man he was just plain man like you and me he all his godly power and authority and qualities he kept aside he walked as a plain man subject to pain and sin it's, sorry I'm not temptation of sin temptation of sin so this is the central thing now you come to the New Testament you come to the New Testament it's very obvious about the cross the whole New Testament is based on the cross of Jesus. Paul says, the Apostle Paul, one of the famous uh, leaders in the New Testament, he said, I preach Christ crucified. I got nothing less. Many people wanted Paul to preach the Christian faith, Christianity, minus cross. But he refused to do that. He said, I preach Christ crucified. That's the only, it is foolishness in the eyes of people who don't want to believe. The cross is foolishness from the point of view of naturally. Uh, wow, you, your God goes and dies on the cross. It sounds foolish. It is sounding foolish. But actually, it is, the, it is God's wisdom. Because God's wisdom is different. God had to sac satisfy his justice. Uh, God had to be a blameless person to die for the sins of the world. Today, anybody who believes in Jesus, death on the cross... He was buried after three days. He rose. He defeated death after three days and received his godly authority again. Anybody who received that act, his sins are washed away. Your destination is changed. Going to hell, going to heaven. So that's it. And plus many other benefits. That's just one of the major benefits is then the cross. Now, in the New Testament, it's fully based on the cross. You take out the cross, the whole Bible is not worth two paisa. I'm, when I'm talking Bible, I mean the books of the Jews, I mean the book of the Christians. There's one chapter, Isaiah 53, so clearly about this, so clearly about Jesus suffered and died. So clearly, so clearly. Isaiah chapter 53. Now lastly, uh, I got just a couple of minutes, right? Now lastly, lastly, in the last book of the New Testament, is a prophetic book about things in heaven. One servant of God by the name John the Apostle. There are two Johns there. One is John the Apostle. He saw visions of heaven. And he said things about trouble in the Euphrates. War in Euphrates. That's the Iraq area. He predicted things what's happening today in the Euphrates. And you can see it for yourself. Just read the Times of India and you'll see all the trouble in the Euphrates. Many, many things have been said. But one thing very special said. He saw in heaven... The lamb that was slain. You see, Jesus is referred to as the lamb that was slain. Of course, Jesus is not lamb physically. He's not a lamb. He's not a sheep. He's a man. Okay? But symbolically, he was that perfect lamb of God. Where throughout the history of the Jews, throughout the history of the New Testaments, God, Jesus is referred to as a lamb. In heaven, he's known as the lamb that was slain. Uh, so, if you take out the cross from the Christian faith, there is no Christian faith. That's a list of do's and don'ts, that's all. There's no salvation, there's no breaking with sin, there's nothing. The cross is very central. The cross is, um, um, is, is the main thing that God gave. God died on my behalf. See, he was willing to come down from heaven. He was willing to walk as man in the pains that man taste. Being tempted in every way you are tempted. If you are tempted, Jesus tasted more than what you, you think. Okay? You believe on him. He breaks that lust and that, that addiction and that bad habit and that curse in your life. Jesus breaks all that from your life. You have to just say yes to him. And tonight you go home and just pray to him. You receive salvation from sin. Uh, I think my time is up. Okay. Happy to
as yet. <laughs> okay, good. It's five minutes. I can do miracles and that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. Um, uh, one thing is, uh, uh, it's for now only. <laughs> okay. It's my label. <laughs> okay. Five minutes is not bad. Huh? <laughs> no problem. Right. Uh, now, uh, there is one evidence of, one, one category of evidence of the cross of Jesus is the Bible. That is the books of the Jews, the books of the New Testament of the Christians thoroughly surrounded the cross directly and indirectly, directly and indirectly. You can read it for yourself. It's available very reasonably priced. There are many barber shops in Bombay. And if you don't know, we will tell you later. Okay. Uh, uh, another level of evidence that Jesus did die and he was sentenced to death is, I'll give you, it is not from the Bible. It's not from the Bible, from the enemies of Jesus. Those who hated Jesus. Unfortunately, the Jews themselves, uh, historically, they rejected the message of Christ. They said, this is not really Christ, this is a false Christ. So finally, they sentenced him to death. Now, if you are aware of, the, the Jewish nation, they maintain current history book. Uh, as major events takes place in the Jewish nation, they record it, uh, with their religious authorities in a book called the Tilmud. Some of you may have heard of it. If you refer to the version of the Tilmud around the time of Jesus, 2,000 years ago, you will read that Jesus was put to death. He, of course, they will say wrong things also. They say he was false Christ. He gave a wrong message. They say he was a magician. They said wrong things. But one thing they said, they say Jesus was put to death because he did wrong things. Uh, but that is another, that is, a, that is not religious. That is outside evidence that Jesus did die. The people who handled him, they did put him to death. That's a, a third, third type of evidence of the cross that is real is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Today Christians, according to the teachings of the Bible, they pray on the sick. They pray on demons. They pray on troubles of life. God heals, God testifies that these people are teaching you correct things. Not in one incident. I myself was healed from a serious spinal disease. There are doctors here, they know what I'm talking about. Ankylosing spondylitis, incurable. A disease that puts you in bed, you cannot walk with it. A disease that will waste your life. And, and 16 years ago, the leaders prayed for me. Uh, I was healed gradually within seven days. I was not religious. I was just believing in Jesus. I was not knowing the Bible, but I had not read even the Bible once at that time. They prayed for me. God confirmed these people are teaching correct things. The cross is real. See, God healed me. And I know people. I know people rose people from the dead. You may, you may, you may argue with me. I got only two, maybe half a minute more. I cannot argue with you. But the people today rose people. From, I myself happened to me. I was walking near uh, Bombay Gymkhana. One little girl. Uh, uh, scooter ran off over her. I carried her dead. She was a, a little less than teenage. Now, I am not a doctor. I cannot tell you about her internal organs functioning or not. But as a layman, I saw her dead. She stopped breathing and she's totally finished. And we rushed her to the hospital. I was praying in Jesus' name for her. And by the time we reached the hospital, she revived and she came back to life. And doctors, doctors uh, just took her for observation in St. George Hospital. Okay, now that is not a confirmed rising from the dead. Let's just give you an example. But people confirmed people from the dead was rose in the name of Jesus. They're defying death today. Defying death. They are healing the sick in the name of Jesus. God is giving acts of mercy and acts of love in Jesus' name. The crucified Jesus. You have faith in him. God will meet your need, need of your life. God will meet the need. Today I don't have time. I will have prayed for all of you. But well, there's no time. But some other time, maybe you could come to our meeting at uh, Damodar Hall classroom on 9 o'clock next Sunday. Parel uh, Naka. We could pray for all of you. My pastor will pray for you. Uh, some people in the church will pray for you. We are not great people. We are not great healers as a brother. As a, uh, huh? We are just ordinary people. I'm just a tuition giver person. I go around houses and giving tuitions. I'm not a great fellow. Even my pastor... He is managing his living somehow and his wife is working in some hospital like that. We are not some he great healers. We just speak things happen. But in Jesus name, he lay hands. Most of the times people receive healings according to the faith, of course. 
God confirming that the message of the cross is true. There are many different levels of proof of the cross. Thank you. Islamic Research Foundation, Bombay. A medical doctor by professional training, he has turned around to make the proper clarification as well as removing misconceptions about Islam, his main mission in life. He is a keen student of Islam and comparative religion. In the last three years itself, Dr. Zakir has delivered more than 300 public talks abroad in addition to his many talks in India. He has also participated in many symposia and debates with prominent personalities of other faith. May I call upon Dr. Zakir to make his presentation on the topic of the day, Was Christ Really Crucified? Dr. Zakir. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain. Amma abad. Auz billahi min shaitani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa qawlihim. Inna qatalna al-masiha. Isa ibn Maryama, Rasulullah, wa ma qatuluhu wa ma salabuhu, wa lakin shubbiha lhum, wa inna allazi naqtalufu fihi la fi shakkim min, ma lhum bihi min ilm, illa tibazzan, wa ma qatuluhu yakina. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Rabbi shuhali sadri, wa yasir li amri, wa ahlu al-ugdata min lisani, yafqahu kawli. Respected Pastor Ruknuddin, or as he likes to be called, Pastor Rockney, Henry Pio, Pastor Saji, the respected pastors from various churches of Bombay, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. Before I dwell into the topic, I would like to clarify the position of Jesus, peace be upon him, in Islam. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. One may ask that if Muslims and Christians both love and respect Jesus, peace be upon him, then where is the parting of ways? The major difference between Islam and Christianity is the Christian's insistence on the supposed divinity of Jesus, peace be upon him. And they say that he was crucified on the cross and he died for the sins of humanity. The topic of today's debate, if you have forgotten, is was Christ really crucified? And since we Muslims and Christians both believe in Jesus, peace be upon him, it's obligatory that we put forth both point of view, the Muslim and the Christian point of view. As far as the Muslim point of view is concerned, we believe the most authentic and sacred book, which is the word of God, is the glorious Quran. And I started my talk by reciting a verse from the Glorious Quran, from Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 157, which gives the verdict, the Islamic viewpoint, regarding the topic of today's debate, was Christ really crucified? And since Pastor Rockney, he's an Arab Christian missionary, Arabic is his mother tongue, I do not have to translate the meaning of what I recited in the beginning of my talk. For him to realize 
to understand what is the Islamic viewpoint. But since most of us don't understand Arabic, Arabic is not a mother tongue, I would like to translate the verse which I recited in the beginning of my talk from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 57, which says, وَقَوْلِيهِمْ They said, the Jews, in boast, إِنَّا قَتَلْنَا الْمَسِيحَ إِيسَ بْنُ مَرِيمَ That we killed Christ, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا سَلَبُوهُ They did not kill him, neither did they crucify him. وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَا لَهُمْ But it was made to appear so. وَإِنَّ الَّذِي نَقْتَلُفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَكِّمْ مِنْ And all those who differ therein are full of doubts. مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ إِلْمْ With no certain knowledge. إِلَّا تِبَا زَنْ With only conjectures to follow. وَمَا قَتَلُهُ يَكِينَ For a surety they killed him not. This verse of the glorious Quran is so explicit unambiguous, making it very clear that the Islamic viewpoint is وَمَا قَتَلُهُ وَمَا سَلَبُهُ They killed him not, neither did they crucify him. وَمَا قَتَلُهُ يَكِينَ For a surety, they killed him not. No one can be more explicit, more unambiguous, more unequivocal than the Quran in this verse saying that he was not killed. If I conclude my presentation right now, without commenting or refuting on the biblical point of view what the pastor has presented, as far as the debate is concerned, it will be a draw, it will be neutral. That the Muslims say, according to the Quran, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not really crucified. And the Christian, according to their understanding of the Bible, they say he was crucified. It would be a draw. But I will not do that. I will prove from the Bible itself, with the Christian's belief to be the word of God, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not really crucified. Let me first clarify that we Muslims, we do not consider the Bible to be the word of God. The Bible may contain certain portions which we may consider it to be the word of God. It contains the word of the prophets, the word of the historians, it also contains absurdity, obscene statements, which if someone even pays me a thousand rupees now, I will not be able to read from the Bible. Such obscene verses, obscene chapters, it also contains contradictions. But even though I don't believe that the Bible is the word of God, yet I will prove from the Bible that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified because Pastor Rockney and many Christians out here, they agree the Bible to be the word of God. So I'll prove from their evidence. Because the Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 111, وَقَالُوا لَا يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ They say, the Jews and Christians, you Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah. With all your piety, with all your righteousness, as pastor said. With all the good deeds, you shall not get salvation. That's what the pastor said in this talk. It's useless. With all your zakat, with the hajj, with the salah, with the mark on your forehead, you shall never enter Jannah. Unless you be a Jew or a Christian. وَقَالُوا لَيَتْخُلُ جَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدًا أَوْ نَسَارًا Unless you are a Jew or a Christian. Allah says, تِلْكَ مَا نِيُّهُمْ This is the wishful thinking. بَقْوَاسَ بَقْوَاسَ Vain desires. Cool! Tell them. حَاتُ أُرَانَكُمْ Produce your proof. إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ But if not fruitful. Allah says, ask them to produce their proof. If I tell from the Quran that Jesus was not crucified, the Christians, they don't agree the Quran to be the word of God. So we have to ask them, قُلْ حَاتُ بُرَانَكُمْ Produce your proof, in kundum sadiqin, but if you're truthful. And the Christians, they have produced their proof, the Bible, as the Burhan. The Christian says, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. Let's analyze what does the Bible says. And they've produced this Bible in no less than 2,000 different languages of the world. So let's analyze from the Bible whether Christ was really crucified. And while doing so, whatever conclusion I draw from the Bible need not necessarily be the Islamic viewpoint. Let me remind you that. 
the conclusion drawn from the Bible need not necessarily be the Islamic viewpoint. The Islamic viewpoint, I have made it very clear, according to Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 157, They killed him not, neither did they crucify him. It's clear cut. The topic, was Christ really crucified? What is the meaning of the English word crucify? According to the Oxford Dictionary, crucify means to put to death by fastening onto the cross. According to the Webster Dictionary, crucify means to put to death by nailing or binding to the cross. In short, for a person to be crucified, he should die on the cross. If he does not die, he is not crucified. What is the meaning of the word resurrection? Resurrection, according to the Oxford Dictionary, means the act or instance of rising from the dead. And resurrection with a capital R means Christ rising from the dead. According to the Webster Dictionary, resurrection means the act of rising from the dead. And resurrection with a capital R means rising again of Christ after his death and burial. In short, for Christ to be resurrected, he has to die. If he does not die, he is not resurrected. Let everyone get this definition is very clear in their mind. According to Jesus' peace be upon him, he says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 and 17, that a person can obtain salvation by keeping the law and the commandments. But according to St. Paul, he nails the laws and the commandments to the cross. Cross, 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 as you heard pastors saying, cross, cross. He nails the law and the commandment to the cross, as he says in Colossians, chapter number 2, verse number 14. And Paul says that salvation can be obtained by believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus, peace be upon him. And he quotes, if you read the New Testament, 1 Corinthians, chapter number 15, verse number 14. I give the reference so that you know people realize I'm not pulling a fast one. I prefer giving references. Otherwise, if I say Bible says this, New Testament says this, in this encyclopedia of more than a thousand pages, where will you find? To make it easy, I give reference. According to St. Paul, 1 Corinthians, chapter number 15, verse number 14, and if Christ has not risen from the dead, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. As the pastor said, that all your good deeds, all your charity, without believing in Christ died for the sin, it is useless. And the Christian missionaries, the reference they didn't give, quoting from Isaiah, chapter number 64, verse number 6, that all our righteousness, all our good deeds are like filthy rags. If you don't believe Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died on the cross for the sin of humanity, all your righteousness, all your good deeds are like filthy rags. And in the words of the pastor, which I wouldn't ever say, he says, if there is no cross, if there is no crucifixion, Bible is less than two pies. And he says, if no crucifixion, there's no Christianity. And I agree with him. And I agree with him. And the pastor said that he came to India and he spent more than two decades here. And only when he came to India, he really realized the message of Christianity. Previously, he was only a Christian, but he became a practicing Christian from the Muslims here. I would like to remind him that I have only met one Arab Christian before in my life, before meeting pastor. One Arab Christian I met in Jeddah from Syria. And after he attended my talk, Alhamdulillah, by Allah's grace, he accepted Islam. This is the second time in my life that personally I'm meeting an Arab Christian. And, inshallah, with Allah's help, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him hidayah, that since he got the teachings of Christianity from the Indians, he will come back to the original faith, which is Islam, which every human being is born in, inshallah, after this talk, after having discussion, inshallah, I pray that he comes back to the original faith, inshallah, realizing that if no crucifixion, no cross, no Christianity. Which inshallah I will do in the course of my time. Let's see what St. Paul has to say. 
regarding resurrection. St. Paul, he comments on resurrected bodies. In the same chapter where he says, if Christ hasn't risen, our faith is in vain, our preaching is in vain. Same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, towards the end of the chapter. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42 to 44, he says that so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. According to St. Paul, the resurrected bodies are spiritualized. They are spiritualized. Same is said by his Lord and Master, Jesus peace be upon him, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 20, verse number 27 to 36. If you remember the story of a woman who had seven husbands, and the Jews come with a poser to Jesus peace be upon him, and it's a Jewish practice that if a man marries a woman, and if he dies without leaving any children, the second brother marries the wife of the diseased brother, so that he can give her his seed. If the second brother dies without leaving any children, the third brother marries, so on and so forth. So here they come with the poser that this woman married seven brothers one after the other. And all of them had her here. Means they had her as a wife here, one after the other. But there was no problem. Why? Since each one of them had turned by turn. So there was no problem. And later on, even she dies. But they pose the question to Jesus, peace be upon him, that in resurrection, who will have her there? Indicating, during resurrection, all the seven brothers will be raised simultaneously, along with the woman, who will have her there? So Jesus, peace be upon him, says, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 20, verse 35 and 36, that resurrected bodies, they do not marry. Neither do they give in marriage. Verse 36 says, that neither shall they die anymore. They are equal unto the angels. That means they shall be angelized. Resurrected body will be spiritualized. Who says that? Jesus says that. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 20, verse 36. Paul says that. First Corinthians, chapter 15, verse number 42 to 44. It's very clear cut. And there's not a single verse anywhere in the gospel which says that Jesus, peace be upon him, was resurrected. In fact, if you read, it's mentioned. If you remember the story that after the Alice crucifixion, when the disciples, they met in the upper room, Jesus, peace be upon him, he comes. It's mentioned in the gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 36. He comes and he says to the disciple, Shalom, in Hebrew, which means peace unto you. Next verse, Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verse 37, says, But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed him to be a spirit. I'm asking a question. Why did the disciples think Jesus' peace be upon him to be a spirit? Did Jesus look like a spirit? And when I asked this question to the Christians, all of them said no. And they are right. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not look like a spirit when he comes to the upper room after the Alice crucifixion. So why did they think that he was a spirit? The reason is because they had heard from hearsay that the master Jesus, peace be upon him, was put on the cross. They had learned from hearsay that he had given up the ghost, that he had died. They had learned from hearsay that he was dead and buried in the grave for three days. Hearsay, hearsay. You know why? Because they were not eyewitnesses. According to Mark, Gospel of Mark, chapter number 14, verse number 50, it says that all of them forsook him and fled. In the most crucial juncture, in the life of Jesus, peace be upon him, when he required them the most, all the disciples, 100%, all of them, according to Mark, chapter 14, verse 50, they forsook him and fled. Who says that? Not Dr. Zakir Naik. Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse number 50. All of them forsaken. So it was from hearsay. Therefore they think and they thought that he was a spirit. But Jesus, peace be upon him, to clarify that out, it's mentioned in the next two verses. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 39 and 40, 
Jesus peace be upon him says that behold my hands and feet it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit has no flesh and bone as you see me have and saying so he shows them his hands and feet he tells them behold my hands and feet it is I myself what has happened to you it is me your Lord and Master Jesus peace be upon him why are you frightened handle me and see behold my hands and feet for a spirit has no flesh and bones what was he trying to prove by showing his hands and feet was he trying to prove that he was resurrected was he trying to prove that your spirit he was trying to prove that he was not a spirit he was not resurrected next two verses gospel of luke chapter number 24 verse number 41 to 42 it says that they were overjoyed and they wondered they thought he's dead and now they're happy that the lord and master is alive physical with flesh and bones in front of them they're happy jesus peace be upon him yet to confirm them says that do you have any meat here and they gave him a piece of broiled fish and an honeycomb and he took it and he ate before them to prove what that he was resurrected to prove that he was spirit to prove that he was a physical body he ate and he chewed in front of them a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb to prove that he was not resurrected he was not a spirit but he was in flesh and bones a physical body If no resurrection, no crucifixion, no fish and blood. If you remember the story of Mary Magdalene, when she goes to the tomb of Jesus, peace be upon him on the third day, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 20, verse number 1, as well as the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 16, verse number 2, that it was the first day of the week, meaning it was a Sunday. Sabbath day is Saturday for the Jews. The first day of the week is Sunday. It was the first day of the week that Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. Now, why should Mary Magdalene go to the tomb on the third day after Jesus Christ, peace be upon, supposedly was dead? Why should she go? The reply is given in the verse earlier, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 16, verse number 1, that Mary Magdalene goes to massage Jesus, peace be upon him, to anoint him. The word is anoint, which the original Hebrew word is masaha means to massage to rub to anoint and from this root word you can even derive the arabic word masih or the hebrew word messiah which means the anointed one which if you translate to greek it means christos from which you get the word christ the anointed one i'm asking a question do jews massage dead bodies on the third day have you any time heard Jews massaging dead bodies on the third day, and the answer is no. I'm asking the Christians. Do Christians massage dead bodies on the third day? And the answer is no. Do Muslims? Do we massage dead bodies on the third day? And the answer is no. So why is she going to the tomb to massage Jesus, who has died on the third day, according to the Christians? You know why? Because she was the only one, besides Joseph of Arimathea, and Nicodemus, who gave the burial bath to Jesus, peace be upon him. And when Jesus' body was fought down, peace be upon him, from the cross, she might have seen some life in the limb body. But naturally, she is not going to say, he's alive! Otherwise, they will put him to death again. Seeing certain life in the limb body of Jesus, peace be upon him, she comes back on the third day, after the Sabbath day, to look for a live Jesus, peace be upon him. A live Jesus, peace be upon him. And it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 20, verse number 1, and the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 16, verse number 4, that she finds that the stone has been removed. And even the winding sheets, they are unbound and placed in a pile. The question is, why should the stone be removed? And why should the winding sheets be unbound? and placed at the side, piled up at the side. If Jesus, peace be upon, was resurrected as a spiritual body, does a spirit require the stone of the entry of the tomb to be removed? If it's a spirit, those cannot stop a spirit from entering. The stone need not be removed. Why was the stone removed? 
And if a spirit has to move, does it have to unbound the winding sheets? It's not required. But if it's a physical body, the stone blocking the entry of the tomb has to be removed. The winding sheets have to be unbound, proving that Jesus peace be upon him. The person who came out of the tomb was a physical body. And the tomb was a private property of the secret disciple of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich and influential Jew. And he had carved a big roomy tomb, maybe for himself, for future, in which Jesus peace be upon him was kept. The tomb or the sepulchre. And according to Jim Bishop, he says, Jim Bishop, not Bible, Jim Bishop, says, it was very roomy, very big. Five feet wide, seven feet in height, and 15 feet in depth. Why do you require a roomy tomb? So that if anyone wants to help a person, it can be done easily. These are small rooms in Bombay. It is approximately 75 square feet. 75 square feet flat is big in Bombay. We find five, six people living in that room in Bombay, one of the most expensive place in the world. 75 square feet, you find four, five people living in it. So roomy enough if they want to help the person. Why would they want to help a spiritual body? A spiritual body is only going to help. But naturally, they want to help a physical body. Further, if you read in the Gospel of John, chapter number 20, verse number 15, Jesus, he sees that Mary Magdalene, from the earth, from terra firma, not from the heaven. He sees her and she's weeping. And he comes to her and asks, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Knowing very well what is the reason, but yet asking. She says, and supposed him to be a gardener. She asks him, where have you taken him and laid him so that I may take him away? I'm asking a question, why did Mary Magdalene suppose Jesus to be, peace be upon him, a gardener? I'm asking a question, do resurrected bodies look like gardeners? Do they? Yes or no? No. So why should she suppose that Jesus, peace be upon him, was a gardener? And the answer is because he was disguised as a gardener. Now why should a spiritual body be disguised as a gardener? Jesus Christ was disguised as a gardener, peace be upon him, because he was afraid of the Jews. A spiritual body need not be afraid of the Jews. Why? Because according to Hebrew, chapter number 9, verse 27, a man dies only once, and after that is the day of judgment. Jesus, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 20, verse number 36, neither shall you die anymore. Because if you're spiritualized, you don't have to be afraid of anyone. No one can harm you. You cannot die a second time. If he's spiritualized, why should he be disguised? Why should he be afraid? Why should he be in hiding? Why should he run away from the Jews? Proving that he was not a spiritual body, but he was alive. And he says to Mary, Mary, the one word is sufficient for Mary to recognize her Lord and Master. You know, because everyone has a particular style of calling the beloved one. And the tone in the style which you call a beloved one is sufficient to recognize who is the person. She immediately recognizes that it is Jesus, peace be upon him. And she rushes forward toward him. Gospel of John, chapter number 20, verse 15, 16, 17. Jesus, peace be upon him, says, Touch me not. Why? Why touch me not? Is he a bundle of electricity that if someone touches him, the person will be electrocuted. Is he a bundle of dynamite that if someone touches, they will blow up? Why does he say, touch me not? Because he was a physical body. Imagine the ordeal, the pain, the physical pain, the emotional pressure that he had going through all that so-called, supposedly put on the cross, put on the cross, all that pain and torture, it will hurt a physical body. He says, touch me not. And then continues and says, in Gospel of John chapter 20, verse number 17, I have not yet ascended unto my father. Meaning what? That he has not yet been dead. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, unequivocally says that he has not yet been resurrected. Proving that he was alive. Later on it's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 16, verse number 11, that the disciples 
they had heard that Jesus, peace be upon him, was alive. From her, Mary Magdalene, but they believe not. You know, the Jews, they are a habit of posing questions, troubling the messengers. The Quran says that, the Bible says that, they posed questions to Moses, peace be upon him, they troubled him, and they harassed him, same they did with Jesus, peace be upon him. Further, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 38. The Jews come up to Jesus, peace be upon him, and say, Master, Rabbi, meaning, O Lord, why don't you give us a sign? Sign meaning a miracle. Miracle. All the good works that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did was not sufficient to convince the Jews. They said, give us a sign, give us a miracle. Maybe, like flying in the air, like walking on the water, like walking on burning charcoal. They wanted some miracle. Sign here doesn't mean a sign on a lamppost. Eh? Like you have signs on the roads. It's not that sign. It particularly means a miracle. And if you read the New International Version, it says a miraculous sign. What is the reply Jesus, peace be upon him, gives? What is the reply he gives? In the next verse, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 39 and 40, he says, You evil and adulterous generation, seek it be after a sign. You seek for a miracle? No sign shall be given to you but the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus, peace be upon him, doesn't say that, see, go and meet Bartimaeus, the blind person who I gave sight. Why don't you ask the woman with issues, who only on touching me she was healed? He didn't refer to the 2,000 pigs he had killed to heal a possessed man. He doesn't say that the 5,000 and the 3,000 people he fed with a broiled fish and with bread. He says, no sign shall be given to you but the sign of Jonah. Jesus, peace be upon him, is putting all his eggs in one basket. The sign of Jonah. And for a person to know the sign of Jonah, he doesn't have to be a scholar of the Bible. He doesn't have to be a doctor of divinity because it is taught in Sunday schools. And in most countries, including India, irrespective whether you are a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu, some way or the other it is taught either in comics or in moral science lessons, the sign of Jonah or Jonah and the way. They know. But if you want to know the sign of Jonah actually in the Bible, in this big book, the sign of Jonah is less than two pages, less than one and a half page. I had the Zorox copy done from the same Bible to make it easy. Less than one and a half side. Less than one and a half side. Only four chapters. And to find one page in the encyclopedia of more than a thousand pages is difficult. But everyone knows the outline of the story. That Almighty God, He asks His messenger, Jonah, peace be upon Him, to go and deliver the message to the Ninevites, to go to Nineveh. But he says, these Ninevites, they are so sinful. What will they listen to the message? He thinks that they will make fun of me. It will be a waste of time. So he goes to Joppa, and from there, he's setting sail to Tarshish. Now, while he's at sea, there's a huge storm. And it was the superstition of the Marines of that time, that if there's a storm at sea, it is because someone has disobeyed the master. And they had their own ways in trying to find who was the person responsible. They had the system of casting of lots. And when they cast lots, it comes to the turn of Jonah, peace be upon him. And Jonah, being a messenger of Almighty God, he agrees and he says that, see, I'm the person responsible. I was told by my master, Lord, to go to Nineveh, but from Joppa, I'm setting sail to Tarshish, running away. I'm at fault. You take me and throw me overboard. But they say, this person, such a pious person, why should simply he be killed? So they try and stir the ship, but yet they are not successful. The storm is yet there. So he says that, why don't you throw me overboard? And finally they agree, and they throw him overboard. When they throw him overboard, the storm subsides. Maybe it was a coincidence. Later on, a big fish, a whale comes, 
and swallows Jonah people upon him. Jonah prays to Almighty God from the belly of the whale. The whale takes Jonah, peace be upon him, for three days and three nights around the ocean and then vomits him out on the seashore. What is the sign of Jonah? Jesus, peace be upon him, says that no sign shall be given to you but the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now I'd like to ask you a question. When Jonah was thrown overboard, was he dead or alive? Before you answer, I would like to make it easy for you. Let's see, Jonah volunteers. He says, I'm the culprit, I'm responsible, throw me overboard. If someone doesn't agree, maybe you'll have to break his leg, you may have to break his, his neck, you may have to twist his arm, but here he volunteers, so they don't have to do all that. So they throw him overboard. I'm asking you a question, when Jonah was thrown overboard, was he dead or was he alive? Alive. The fish comes and follows him, was he dead or alive? alive? Alive. He prays to Almighty God from the belly of the whale. Was he dead or alive? Do dead men pray? Was he dead or alive? Alive. alive. The whale takes Jonah three days and three nights in the ocean. Dead or alive? alive? Alive. Fish vomits him out on the seashore. Was he dead or alive? Alive. Alive, 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 alive. When a person is thrown overboard in a raging sea, he ought to die. If he dies, no miracle. If he's alive, it's a miracle. Fish comes and follows him. He ought to die. He doesn't die. It's a miracle. Three days and three nights, suffocation and heat, in the belly of the whale, he ought to die. He doesn't die. It's a miracle. It's a miracle of a miracle of a miracle. Miracle of a miracle of a miracle. Jesus said, peace be upon him, as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah was alive. But when I pose the question to my Christian brothers, and they are our brothers, they are our cousins, what do you call? They are brothers. When I pose the question to the Christians, that how was Jesus, peace be upon him, in the tomb according to you? And all of them say, that he was dead. He was dead. I am asking a question. Jonah was alive. Jesus, peace be upon him, was dead. So was Jesus, peace be upon him, alike or unlike Jonah? Like or unlike? Unlike. So Jesus, peace be upon him, does not fulfill the prophecy. He puts all his egg in one basket and says no sign shall be given but the sign of Jonah. And here the prophecy is not fulfilled. For the prophecy to be fulfilled, he should be alive. As I proved in the earlier part of my talk, he was alive. Otherwise, Jesus, peace be upon him, will be a liar. Now, Billah, which we cannot agree. We respect him. We revere him. So for him to fulfill the prophecy, he should be alive. And Jesus, peace be upon him, was alive, as I proved in the earlier part of my talk. As I said, that for a person to be crucified, he should be put to death on the cross. If he does not die on the cross, he is not crucified. There are some people who may say, let's see here the main part of the sign is not dead or alive, it's the time factor, time factor. You know, three days and three nights, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. Three is mentioned four times. The main important emphasis is three, three, three. It is not dead or alive. I say, what is so unique about three? If I say, I took three days and three nights to reach Delhi, is it a miracle? What is so miracle about three? Three days or three weeks? It's not a miracle. But they say, no, it is a time factor. Let's analyze whether Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, fulfills the time factor which the Christians, some Christians say, is the main theme of the sign. As I said earlier, and we know that when we ask the Christians that when was Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, crucified? And according to the Bible, the Christians will say, on a good Friday. So we ask him, what is so good about the Friday? They say, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died for our sins. Therefore, it's a good Friday. And if you read that it was, the trial was in a hurry, there were hurry 
for the trial. They were in a hurry to put him up on the cross. They were hurry to get him down because, as Pastor said, no one can stay overnight hanging on the cross on the Sabbath, according to, he didn't mention the reference, Deuteronomy chapter number 21, verse number 23. The land will get cursed. So they were hungry to get him down. And they give the burial bath, and it is by the time late in the evening. He's put in the sepulchre late in the evening. And according to the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 1, it was the first day of the week, Sunday morning, that the tomb was found empty by Mary Magdalene. So supposedly, Jesus was in the tomb on Friday night. Why do I say supposedly? Because the Bible does not say, when does Jesus leave the tomb? Maybe he left on Friday late night or Saturday morning. It doesn't say. Agreeing that latest he might have left is in early morning on Sunday. So Jesus was in the tomb Friday night, supposedly. He was there in the tomb Saturday day, supposedly. He was there in the tomb Saturday night, supposedly. Sunday morning, the tomb is empty. So he was there for two nights and one day. But the sign says three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Three days and three nights. But Jesus, peace be upon him, was actually one day and two nights. Is three days and three nights equal to one day and two nights? Is it equal? Three days and three nights equal? No. So even the time factor which they boast about is not fulfilled. The real thing is, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was alive. For a person to be crucified, he should die on the cross. Just to make easy for the pastor in the rebuttal time he has, I list the major points proving that he was not crucified, he was not resurrected, because he was alive. If he's alive, no crucifixion, no resurrection. He was put on the cross and brought down very fast in three hours. In three hours, it's difficult for a person to die. Therefore, Jesus was alive. When he's brought down, even his two crossmates, they are alive, proving that even Jesus was alive. Point number two. Point number three, his legs were not broken. What use is a broken leg to a dead man, proving that he was alive? Point number four, that the stone was removed and the winding sheets were unbound, proving that Jesus, peace be upon him, was alive. Point number five, that he was disguised as a gardener. Why? Because he was alive, trying to be saved from the Jews. Point number six, the tomb was roomy. It was spacious. What use is a spacious tomb for a dead person, proving Jesus was alive? Point number seven, that when Mary Magdalene goes to touch Jesus, peace be upon him, he says, touch me not. Why? He was a physical body. He was alive. It will hurt him. He was in pain, proving that he was alive. Jesus, peace be upon him, says that I have not yet ascended unto my father. That means he was alive. Point number nine, Mary Magdalene, not of recognizing Jesus, peace be upon him. Point number ten, that in the upper room, he shows his hands and feet to prove that he was not a spirit, but he was alive. Point number eleven, that they were overjoyed to see him. Why? Because they thought he's dead and the spirit form. They were overjoyed to see because he was alive. Point number 12. He ate a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb to prove that he was alive. The disciples had heard from Mary Magdalene that he was alive. Point number 14. The sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the the heart of the earth, alive, alive, alive. If he's alive, no crucifixion, no resurrection. So in short, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was put on the cross, according to the Bible, but he did not die. Now, the topic is that was Christ really crucified? If he's put on the cross and if he dies, he's crucified. If he's put on the cross and does not die, what is one word that we'll use? See, English language, is deficient. If you look up in the dictionary for a word, for a person who's put on the cross but does not die, you will not find any word. So we have to coin new word. The best word that we can coin is that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified, but he was crucifixed. It is not crucifixion, C-R-U-C-I-F-I-X-I-O-N, but it is crucifixion, C-R-U-C-I. 
F I C T I O N. It's a fiction. We have to coin a new word. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucifixed. He was crucifixed. So I hope this ends the friction and the pastor will agree and the confusion will be removed from his mind that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified. There is no crucifixion, F I X O N, but crucifixion, F I C T I O N. I'd like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Al Imran, chapter number three. Verse number 54, which says, wa makaru wa makar Allahu, wallahu khairul makreen. They planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planner. Wa akhru dawan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.